Hello, and welcome to Influential Minds, an EEI International Conversation Series. Today, EEI International Programs is excited to welcome Max Bazerman, professor at Harvard Business School. He joins us to discuss his book, Complicit, How We Enable the Unethical and How to Stop. He will be joined in conversation by our host, EEI Senior Vice President for International Programs, Dr. Lawrence Jones. Good morning, hello everyone, and welcome to this new edition of the Influential Minds. We're very excited this morning to have as our guest, Max Bezerman. Max is a professor of Harvard, at the Harvard Business School and author of the new book, Complicit, Highly Able and Ethical Max, welcome to the Influential Minds. Yeah, I'm delighted to be with you to have a conversation with you. Thank you. And, and I guess you're not calling from Massachusetts today. You're calling in from, uh, from Berkeley, California. That's correct. My normal home is Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I'm currently in Berkeley, California. Well, thank you for getting up early this morning for us to start this conversation. First of all, Max, uh, this is your third book on ethics. You've written three books. We'll get into this one, Complicit, how, uh, you know, how, how to, uh, to stop uh, complicity and how to enable, stop enabling it on ethical. But I think before we get there, just talk a little bit about ethics. How, how would you define ethics and how, why is ethics so important? So um, philosophers have been defining ethics in different ways for a very long period of time. For me, ethical behavior involves creating the most value for the for the um, most for, for, to maximize value creation across all people or even all sentient beings. So the more good you can create, the more ethical your decision. Mm, that's interesting. And as as a scholar, Max, uh, you know, can ethics be taught? Because I was reading the book, I kept asking myself, hmm, this thing about ethics, how do I teach it to my kids? Or how do I teach yeah. it to myself? Can it be taught? Yeah, so so I think that we can all think of sort of the easy ones. It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to cheat. It's wrong to lie. Um, and, and quite honestly, um, we don't need a new book to talk about that. Most of my work focuses on the psychology of how good people engage in bad behavior, often without their own awareness. So you mentioned that I've written prior books. I wrote a book called Blind Spots with Anne Ten Brunson in 2011, which is a, all, all about telling us about how people actually behave. So people are sometimes sexist or racist without any intention of doing so. Um, people are affected by conflicts of interests without being aware that it affects them. So we all can understand that when people have an incentive to do something in a certain way, they may be biased in that direction. We just don't think that it affects us. Um, but my more recent work focuses on how do we move toward more ethical behavior, which again, I de define as creating more value for a broader spectrum of individuals. Um, and the current book, um, uh, Complicit, is all about how to create more value by um, avoiding complicity. So when there's wrong behavior around us, how do we um, uh, sort of muster the courage to act in a way that doesn't lead us to become complicit with the unethical behavior? Okay. So, so on ethical behavior, how we, how, we, how we stop it, and you get into this whole notion of complicity. And so why did you write this book then, Max? Sure. So um, uh, this book wasn't even on my radar screen um, as we moved into 2021. And then on January 6, 2021, there was an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. And I was stunned by those events, as many people were, and was surprised to see um, so, um, a number of white supremacists trying to take over the U.S. Capitol. Um, we saw what appeared to be an actual threat to our democratic system. And I was shocked that, this, that these events could have uh, emerged. And how could they occur? One person alone couldn't create these events. And I became fascinated by the many, many politicians who were complicit in allowing the, the many of the illegal Trump behaviors to emerge. Mm -hmm. And um, as I thought about it, I started thinking about all the other scandals that we read about, whether it's Purdue Pharmaceuticals or Theranos or Bernie Madoff. And 
in, in every episode, if you take a deeper look, it's not just one person who the media became obsessed by, but it's dozens or hundreds of people that surround the wrongdoer who allow these events to emerge. Um, and that that topic became an obsession. So basically, I, I studied the details of all the scandals that people have read about or have watched miniseries about. Um, and the more I learned, the more I saw an interesting story about other people around the wrongdoer. And the book attempts to be a call to all of us to examine our own complicity and to identify how we would like to behave in the future that might be somewhat different than the way we've behaved in the past. What I like about the book, Max, is the, the sincerity that most authors write these books and don't actually get into their own flaws, if you may, but you were very candid in talking about your own level of complicity uh, in, in, certain, in certain aspects. And I think that was very inspiring to read about. Uh, and we can get into some of them as well. But look, as I was preparing, you know, for the last, doing my last preparation for today, I was reflecting on the irony that we're having this conversation on, uh, you know, today being International Women's Day. Uh, and then last night, like I said, this whole uh, this whole episode with uh, fentanyl as uh, was shown on CNN. And I was thinking, you know, when I look back and I, you know, I think of what you write in the book, especially the fact that, those candles, especially the one with the, you know, the Harvey Weinstein situation that led to the Me Too movement. You know, what what comes to mind, to your mind, when you think of why did it happen? I mean, why were people so complicit in in, in letting these atrocities, if you may, in the case of the Weinstein and many other atrocities, the Holocaust and, and, and slavery and others, what do you think made people sit back and just let it happen? So, um, uh, terrific question. So, you know, I, I think that there are a multitude of reasons why we end up being complicit, and that's really the structure of the book. So I talk about some of the uh, the, the obvious ones, uh, what we think of as intentional complicity, or people who are partners with the crime doer, or people who are collaborators who are willing to make trades. So um, Mitch McConnell, um, I, I wouldn't accuse him of being a white supremacist, but he was willing to put up with the white supremacy, white supremacy arguments coming out of the White House in order to make trades for things that he cared about in return. So we, we see th these intentional behaviors, but more of the book is focused on implicit complicity or ordinary complicity, where people are complicit because it's not their job to monitor um, someone else's behavior because they're loyal to the institution. So how did people put up with the child abuse at Penn State or Michigan State or within the Catholic Church? And I think so often the answer lies in the fact that people have loyalty to um, the institutions in which the bad behavior occurs, or they have a loyalty or respect for authority within an organization. So um, they don't question Harvey Weinstein because they're concerned about their own career um, and they're and, and and they let themselves off of the hook because they're not perpetrating the crime. They're simply looking the other way. And, and I certainly see the book as a call to not look the other way, but mm -hmm. to identify your responsibility as a human being. And if you wanted to create more value, what would you be doing? And I think often the answer is speaking up more than we tend to do. Yeah. And look, I, I really encourage the audience to get this book because I like the examples you gave and the narratives around the different stories and scandals, if you may. But but let's let's talk about, you know, you talk about, you know, the what you call obvious complicity. And and you talk about the two sort of a two groups, if you may. First, what you call true partners, and, mm -hmm. and then you talk about collaborators. Can you just elaborate a little bit on the distinction between those two? Sure, absolutely. True partners are people who are in cahoots with the with the lead wrongdoer, and they want the same outcome as the wrongdoer. So there, so um, there were certainly organizations who supported the white supremacist statements that we often heard coming out of Donald Trump. There are other people, politicians, who didn't share those values, but were interested in political appointments to the Supreme Court or other things that they that they wanted, in which they were willing to trade their values in order to get what they wanted 
in return. So if we think back to the Nazi regime in, in World War II, there were many people who didn't share the values of the Nazis, but were willing to collaborate with them in order to protect their own interests. And you can certainly think about the Vichy government or many Eastern European countries who basically um, ended up cooperating with the Nazis, again, not because they shared the Nazi values, but they were willing to make trade-offs for their own selfish interests. Mm. So what is interesting, I think, looking at those two categories, I think we need to find and ask ourselves, how do we make sure we're not a collaborator or we're not true partners? And really, it's a, it's a fine line to walk when you, when you get into the psychology of complicity, right? I think that that's right. So, I, you know, I think that when people are true partners or they're collaborating, they often know that they're what they're doing. That's why I call it intentional complicity. They're, they're aware. Um, I think that the people listening to your show, um, to, to, your, to your series, um, are more likely to be affected by what I call implicit complicity um, or the ways in which people um, end up being complicit often without their own awareness. Mm. So let's, let's then talk about you know, privilege. Uh, in the book, you, you give a very interesting scenario about privilege uh, where yourself uh, seem to be uh, questioning your own level of complicity in terms of being privileged. So talk a little bit about privilege and sure. why so, people see, see this as, as a warning sign when they deal with complicity. Sure. So I spent five chapters talking about implicit complicity or, or ordinary complicity, the first of which is uh, when we're benefiting from privilege. And, and since you asked about the story that I told in the book about myself, um, let me start by saying, um, you know, five years ago, if you use the word, if you, if someone said that Max is privileged, I probably would have bristled at that statement because um, I grew up uh, first generation college, um, inner city, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I, w- I, I, earned, I, I earned my spare money as a ballpark vendor at Pirates and Steelers games. Um, I was far from kind of a prototype of a privileged individual. But um, the more I've learned and the more I've thought about it, it's stunning how many privileges that I have. Um, By being a Harvard professor, I have access to opportunities that lots of other people with similar talent um, might not. By being a white male, I've had the privilege of not being discriminated against as much over the last um, 50 years. So um, the, we, we can think of lots of times when, we're, when we have privilege, even if that, that word wouldn't necessarily resonate. And this came to um, the forefront in a story that I, I tell in the book um, about um, an organization called the Academy of Management Fellows. Now, the Academy of Management um, is an organization of about 18,000 business school professors that has an annual meeting every summer. Um, And within the Academy of Management, there's a small group called the Academy of Management Fellows, which is an honorary society of about 200 professors who have been um, elected into this organization, which um, some may perceive as providing prestige. And it's kind of interesting to think about the history of this organization because Before the Academy of Management existed back in 1936, there were there was a small group of white male Midwestern professors um, who gathered for dinner once a year. And um, and they enjoyed their dinner together. And by 1947, this broader organization was created. But the the 1936 group continued to meet one evening when the Academy of Management met and they called themselves the fellows. So they self-appointed themselves to be the fellows. <laughs> and then they came up with a sort of a system for adding new members. And, and the basic system was you could nominate one person a year if you wanted, and the rest of the group would um, vote on whether or not to add that person to membership. And it turns out that when you start with white males um, and you give them the opportunity to nominate one person, they often nominate people who are like themselves. And not surprisingly, um, sort of many, many decades later, um, there's an organization that is overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly American within 
within America, even perhaps biased toward the Midwestern states. Hmm. And we, we kind of see this legacy of if you happen to have certain characteristics, you are much more likely to be invited to membership. It's also interesting that the group allows only one nominee per year per member. And um, it's a very different task to think about who comes to your mind first. And often it's a former doctoral student um, or a colleague at your own uh, at a university that you know well. Um, and we're far less likely to think about somebody who lives in a foreign distant land um, who might be equally worthy of membership. So we can see how you could have privilege because you happen to be associated with a particular set of demographic characteristics. Um, and, um, and I think there's lots of things that we can do to um, eliminate this kind of propensity. We can encourage members to think more broadly about who is deserving of membership. We could encourage people to think about people who are more distant from themselves who may be worthy of membership. Um, but when we simply have this informal network and we allow it to operate, we could easily end up providing more and more privilege to the people who are most connected to the existing membership. So in essence, what I hear is that you can, you literally can be privileged and you can perpetuate a system that is flawed uh, without you knowing it. Uh, exactly. And, and, and not only that, um, Lawrence, I would say I, I'm, I was guilty of that. So I had been a member of this honorary group for a long time. And the, the group doesn't do much. It meets for dinner once a year. <laughs> um, and um, But I, I didn't think about it. You know, sort of I would show up at dinner and um, and I would see some of my old friends. And then I would get a sort of an email saying, do you want to nominate somebody? And I would think about which of my former doctoral students wasn't yet a member, and mm -hmm. I would nominate someone. And, and if we look back 15, 20 years ago, there weren't that many uh, people who offered diversity to business school mm -hmm. um, faculty. So, uh, so I think that you know, I had nominated a number of um, Caucasians and hadn't ever stopped and um, sort of deliberated about the fact of how could I contribute to creating a more representative group of people in this organization? Yeah, interesting. We'll come back and talk a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the context of privilege and how organizational structures need to change uh, and how leaders need to be cognizant of certain levels of complicity about the system that exists. But I was also intrigued by the example regarding false prophets. And, yeah. and specifically, I was intrigued for two reasons because the last name of the person you talk about in the book happens to be Jones. <laughs> no, no pun intended. But talk about Jim Jones, this 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 character, and how how the complicity around him led to nine hundred people dying. Sure. So um, so Jim Jones um was a leader of the People's Temple Church, um, which many people would describe as a cult. I um, mean, it was based in the Bay Area. And at some point they moved um, um, uh, to the Caribbean, to Guyana. And, um, and, um, and Jim Jones was um, engaged in truly egregious behaviors. Um, they were clearly abusive and criminal. Um, and um, he set himself up as a prophet. And the members bought into this. And um, the end of this, uh, the end of the, of the People's Temple ends up being an episode where um, a congressperson uh, visits Guyana and is clearly learning of the terrible things that are occurring. And Jim Jones has all the members drink, quote unquote, the Kool-Aid. Now, um, Kool-Aid isn't happy with that description because it wasn't Kool-Aid, it was Flavor-Aid. Um, but it was the important part was there was poison in the drink. And basically lots of uh, the, the, the vast majority of the members there um, ended up committing suicide and killing their children um, as well. And it's kind of fascinating that people could sort of believe in such a false prophet, but we see many cult leaders who get commitment at shocking at shocking levels. And, and I'm a business school professor, so I, I, I don't claim to be an expert at the psychology of cult membership. But what I find fascinating 
is when we see cult-like behavior exist within the corporate context. So um, um, Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos mm -hmm. ends up creating this technology and um, you know, makes a variety of uh, promises and commitments um, to the venture community and to potential customers um, about her blood testing equipment um, that, 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 that's exaggerated. And over time, she escalates her commitment to her fraud. Um, and, and part of the story of how do you keep this fraud secret when so many employees are working on it is a part of the answer is to create a cult-like sense that Elizabeth Holmes is a prophet. The old rules no longer apply. We're in a new economy. If you, if you don't trust us, um, you don't belong in this organization. And there were prohibitions in Theranos from talking to people in other parts of the organization. So there's enormous secrecy, and there was a requirement that you viewed Elizabeth Holmes as a prophet um, of a new business order in order to be part of the organization. And this kind of behavior can lead people to be complicit because they're willing to put up with behaviors that with more deliberation, they would they I, I believe they would find kind of unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you, you mentioned trust. I think trust also has a role to play, Max, in terms of why you end up becoming complicit. You trust people and loyalty. I mean, the examples you give in the book about the Harvey Weinstein situation, Volkswagen, the diesel gate, uh, all of this sort of a speak to this whole role that authority and loyalty has to do in terms of people being complicit without even knowing they're being complicit because some of that's illegal, some of that's wrong. Absolutely. So Dieselgate is kind of a fascinating story where Volkswagen fraudulently misled um, people across, uh, across the world about their diesel engines claiming that, um, that they produce far lower emissions than was actually true. Um, and, and undoubtedly, there were some true evildoers who were polluting the air and charging customers for things that they weren't actually getting. Um, so th there were undoubtedly a, a number of people who were sort of explicitly involved in this corruption that affected the health of tens of thousands of people. Um, but it's also interesting to think about the fact that the unions and the lower Saxony government within Germany basically went along with Volkswagen out of a, some sense of loyalty um, to um, this particular brand, to the economic boom that, would, that was being created by this brand. And um, these individuals who deferred to, to, to Volkswagen leadership really um, were complicit in, 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 the health, in, in the health hazards that were created to so many people and to a truly unacceptable level of deception. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, before we get into talking about the psychology and some of the traps that ends up uh, leading us down the road of being complicit, I just want to reflect a little bit on the, you know, the unethical organizational systems. And you begin in the book uh, by going directly to the energy sector and talking about the Enron case. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit? What stood out when you look at Enron and, and, and the sort of unethical practices there? Where was the complicity? Was it more uh, collaborative, or was it more uh, partnership? No, so I, so I think that it's, it, it, I think both, but I think that a fascinating part of the story is to think about the role of Arthur Anderson, the, the accounting firm who ends up um, al uh, also being eliminated as a result of their behavior um, connected to Enron. And um, what I find fascinating is that you know uh, prior uh, prior to Enron collapsing in uh, 2001 2002, um, Arthur Anderson was viewed as a highly reputable firm, but they were in a industry that I think has a fundamental problem, and that is it's an industry built on deception. And the industry I'm talking about is the independent auditing industry. Um, and the deception is to claim that they're providing independent audits. In the United States and in most developed economies, we have a system by which corporations are audited by a quote unquote independent auditor, but those auditors have an incentive to please the clients because when you tell a corporation that their books aren't good, 
you risk that they no longer hire you as the auditor. Mm -hmm. We allow auditors to also sell consulting services. So when you tell them that their books aren't good, you may well lose your consulting business as well. And we allow people who work on audits. So um, employees at an accounting firm um, to move from the accounting firm to take jobs with their clients. So when you mm -hmm. take part in identifying what's wrong with the books of the firm, uh, you're basically cutting off a potential um, employer from hiring you into the future. So um, what what happens at, 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 at Enron is that, you know, Arthur Anderson provides consulting advice that's um, th that affects the the details of of uh, of the criminal action that so many at Enron were involved in. But there's also, you know, hundreds of people working on the Enron account who who simply either don't notice or don't speak up about um, the problematic hints that they see going on. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I don't blame the auditor who doesn't notice. I blame the um, the uh, top of the organization at Arthur Anderson um, who um, creates the incentives mm -hmm. for people to not notice. I blame um, the people at the accounting firms, including the ones that continue to exist today. There are four large accounting firms who lobby to keep Congress from implementing um, reforms that would create true auditor independence. Um, I blame Congress for the fact that um, uh, for the fact that we don't um, change the legislation and prohibit um, auditing firms from from selling other services. Um, there are a variety of reforms that we could create to fix those systems, and it's and and it's not just auditors. Obviously, we allow doctors who decide what prescription to um, recommend to us to earn consulting fees from the pharmaceutical firms that are providing prescriptions. It's a little bit scary to think that your doctor is biased by mm -hmm. who in fact provides a consulting fee, yet we know that to be true um, in so many cases. So I think we need to think about our the the institutions that we create and why we why why we allow them to continue to exist in their existing form. So good a good segue then to move into this institutional aspect of sort of the organizational systems. And before we do that, let me just tell the audience if you have any questions for for Max, please go ahead and type it in the chat box. We'll try to get to as many as possible. We have about half an hour left here. So so Max, let's let's talk about then the sort of an organizational aspect of this, right? Uh, there was one question that came in a comment from someone uh, watching about, you know, they can't really believe that these organizations didn't know what was going on, right? If you go back to the Harvey Weinstein case, uh, you, Weinstein, sorry, you, you didn't know that people actually knew things were going, but they said nothing, right? Uh, you have the situation where boards, uh, in some, some of the examples you gave, they knew about it. So what is it about the institutional structures that, don't allow people to speak up when they see these wrongdoings occurring. Yeah. So, so um, if we move into a piece of the psychology of what's going on here, mm -hmm. um, most of us view errors of commission as problematic. That is, if you engage in a particular behavior, um, like cheating or stealing or lying, we view that as bad. Mm -hmm. But we don't hold people accountable for the errors of omission, for what they don't do. So part of the problem is that um, sort of pick your legal standard, pick your um, religious standard. Um, there are lots of rules about what you shouldn't do that would be errors of commission. But we don't think about the errors of omission. Mm -hmm. And then we also hear things like stay in your own lane. It's not within my jurisdiction. And so often, uh, when we see unethical actions around us, it's things that are not within our limited frame. And many of us work within organizations uh, that teach respect for authority. And my reaction is authority has a role, but we shouldn't defer to authority when deferring to authority um, allows um, truly evil behavior mm -hmm. to occur. So, um, I think all uh, uh, the leaders who are listening can think about their own organization 
And what norms are created within their organization for speaking out? Is there a way for someone to go above their boss's head if their boss is engaged in truly unethical action? One of um, my favorite examples, which I talk about in the book, um, comes from one of my clients, um, a very large corporation that everybody would know by name if I was allowed to say the name. And they created a one-hour video for internal consumption only. And they have four different senior vice presidents, each talking about the time that they went above their boss's head because their boss was engaged in inappropriate action. Mm -hmm. And part of the point is these folks rose to the level of senior vice president because they were acting consistent with the values of the organization rather than simply deferring to authority and loyalty. And I think that that's the kind of organization we want to create. But our leaders need to think about um, what incentives, what norms exist within their organization and what role they could play in creating a more ethical and more effective organization. So we see complicity throughout society. We see it in the workplace, we see it in politics, you know, we see it in corporations, you, you see it all over the place. You even see it in our our individual life, right? So so just briefly, the psychology, what are some of the factors that ends up making us complicit when we see wrongdoing occur? Yeah, so, so we've talked about one of the pieces of psychology, the fact that we um, tend to obsess with errors of commission, but we tend to um, ignore errors of omission. So, so I would, I, I think that that's one answer. I, I think another important answer is that that human beings tend to like simple explanations for events. So, why did a why did a particular event occur? Um, we tend to look, come up with one simple answer, and that answer tends to go to the core wrongdoer rather than at all the people who are around them. So, I'll, I'll give you one example from my teaching experience. Um, I was teaching a group of very senior executives who had already done, who had already spent um, a, an entire class, an 80 minute class discussing Theranos. Um, and they had read a, a case on Theranos, they had discussed Theranos, they had talked about the role of the board of directors and the neglect of the board of directors and providing appropriate oversight over Elizabeth Holmes. They had talked about the role of Walgreens in bringing this, um, this ineffective technology into their drug stores. Um, they had talked about the role of, the, of, of, the, of investors and, and their failure to provide appropriate due diligence. And a, a couple of months after they had been through this class, I was teaching this group um, on Zoom during COVID. And I simply uh, started the class by saying, um, can you write your answer into chat, but don't hit send until I say send? What caused the fraudulent behavior at Theranos? And the interesting part, and then I would have, then I had them hit send, and 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 I kept the answers. And the vast majority of the answers had to do with the ego or unethical conduct of Elizabeth Holmes. Okay, very few people mentioned the complicitors who were involved. In fact, nobody even mentioned Sonny Balwani, um, uh, Elizabeth Holmes' romantic partner, the president of the company, um, who has been sent sentenced to jail for his role um, in this behavior. They, we focus on one simple explanation, and Elizabeth Holmes became the face of the Theranos story. Again, I don't mean to let her off the hook at all. I think um, she engaged in criminal behavior, and, and, and the court system has sort of agrees with that assessment. So I'm not arguing that we should let the core wrongdoer off the hook. I'm simply arguing that the core wrongdoer couldn't do what they did without the complicit behavior of so many other people. Mm. In, 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 it's interesting you mentioned the quote, the, the behavior of many others. Uh, you know, some people are empowered to speak up. They take the risk. Others don't. And in the book, you, you gave a few examples of people who, sort of stepped up and, and took the risk and, and spoke up. Uh, you, you know, you talk about Simone Biles, you, you talk about, uh, obviously, um, uh, Senator Mitt Romney and, and, and those folks. What is, you know, what do you see as the power of coming together as a group in terms of, 
wanting to to make a statement. I mean, we talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do you see uh, raising your voice as a group much more effective at times in speaking up as opposed to taking the risk as an individual? Absolutely. So in many cases, avoiding complicity comes with some risk, and and we should be aware of that. You know, personally, I think that it would be great if, if all of us thought about what behavior would we tolerate and what would lead us to speak up in advance? Because I think it's easier to speak up if we thought if we've deliberated about that topic before we're in the midst of an episode. But but you bring up the social aspect of speaking up, and what's fascinating is in so many stories, um, individuals speak up when they know that they have a partner. Even if we go with Theranos, um, core to the fact that uh, Theranos story ended and um and and the world found out about this story was the fact that Tyler Schultz um in, an employee at Theranos and the grandson of George Schultz um very famous um, um politician um who was on the board of Theranos and who was um sort of fascinated by Elizabeth Holmes it was Tyler Schultz who spoke up but he spoke up after he realized he had a partner. So there was yeah. another employee, Erica Chung, and they spoke up together. <clears throat> and they went to um, George Schultz together in order to, to clarify the fact that uh, there was wrong wrongdoing occurring at Theranos. And I think that across so many stories, um, people don't want to be a lone whistleblower. Mm -hmm. And they're more comfortable if they know that there's another person or other people involved, it helps clarify that that to, to to themselves that they're not crazy, but it also avoids them being isolated when they have a partner. Um, um, so I think that often when something's wrong in your organization, perhaps check in with your closest colleagues and friends who might be observing similar behavior. Mm -hmm. um, the book um, ends with a story that, that I only ran into um, as I was finishing up the book. I was hiking in the woods with um, a former senior executive of a well-known financial organization. And I, he asked me what I was working on and I kind of described complicit um, at an early stage. And he told me the story about the time that he was in a meeting reviewing executives um, for their kind of annual review. And there was a particular individual who was being reviewed and there were primarily very positive comments being made. In the back of his mind, he was thinking, but I've heard from multiple women that they've been harassed by this individual. Mm -hmm. And and this person had the courage to say, um, should we at least discuss the fact that I've heard these rumors from multiple sources about his social behavior that might be inappropriate. And as soon as he did, everyone else at the table had other stories about the same individual about sexual harassment. And this person soon no longer was employed at this organization. So there was this, so everybody was sitting on it, but the ability to find out whether or not this observation is shared by other people can be a powerful lever, lever. And finally, I think leaders can do so much to lead people to speak up. up. So, so organizations like Theranos went out of their way to try to keep employees from talking to each other. I think we want our employees talking to each other about what goes, goes on in the organization. And we could also, in some cases, um, institute um, uh, structures that help reporting of wrongdoing. So there are um, so one of the problems that exists in many organizations, including within academia, is um, sexual harassment. And we know that perpetrators tend to be reper repeat perpetrators. Mm -hmm. So many universities now have systems whereby <clears throat> there's a computer platform, and if you've been harassed or assaulted in an inappropriate way, um, you can report the incident to a to a platform, a computer platform, and absolutely nobody will read it or see it until another person reports the same perpetrator. Mm -hmm. So now when, um, let's assume a stereotypic um, um, male perpetrator and a female victim, 
it's not he said, she said, it's a, a minimum, he said, she said, and she said. Mm -hmm. And this may well provide comfort in order to provide the information to stop future behavior like that uh, from occurring. So before we, before we talk briefly about how do we now confront our own uh, complicity in life, uh, and we're talking here at Ensley to institute all the energies on our minds all the time. Uh, we're you know, looking at the world and looking at this big role of how we use energy in the world and the energy transition. Um, when we talk about you know, using, say, natural resources, for example, um, one of the things you talk about in the book is you know, how uncertainty, when we see something, we're not sure, so we're cautious, right? And so you see cases where someone who's working from an energy company somewhere in the world might see something fraudulent or they may suspect it, but they're not too sure. So uncertainty kind of makes us a little cautious. Should I speak up? Should I not speak up? You saw the situation at Enron as well. What advice would you like to give to people in terms of how do you manage uncertainty? You see or you suspect something wrong. Uh, you want to speak up, but you're not sure. How do you navigate that level of uncertainty when it comes to, to this particular situation? Sure. So, um, so, so first, I'll, I'll tell you a, um, a quick story, again, about my own failure to act. Um, so I was an expert witness um, for the Department of Justice in a um, lawsuit against the tobacco industry. And um, at some point, um, I this was in 2005, at some point I re received a request that was very peculiar to amend my testimony in ways that I thought would weaken it mm. from the Department of Justice. And, and I said no, and then I moved on in life. But it was pretty peculiar episode. My side was asking me to weaken my testimony. And I didn't know what was going on. So I had this kind of uncertainty. And life was overwhelming. And um, I had said no. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't commit an act of commission by weakening my testimony. But I moved on in life. And then seven weeks later, I read about another expert witness in the case who came forward accusing the Department of Justice of corrupting his testimony. And this story that existed in the New York Times sounded just like the episode I had mm -hmm. observed. And at this point, I went forward and the Washington Post covered my story. And uh, there was a con congressional demand to investigate the story and et cetera, et cetera. So eventually I came forward, but I didn't until I saw someone else make the same accusation. And um, and um, and I, I think I made a mistake by not sort of acting earlier. And when I tell a story, this story to executives, they commonly said, "Say, but you did the right thing. You didn't. You didn't change your testimony." And I said, "Yeah, but I didn't call the New York Times or the Washington Post to report what was going on." And um, when I tell the story to journalists. They often say, yeah, the best stories are when you can't figure out what's going on to begin with. Mm -hmm. And and I find that summary statement just fascinating. Mm -hmm. When there looks like something's going wrong in your organization and you can't figure out what's going on, that may be where there, there's the most need for you to take action. And that doesn't mean accusing someone of wrongdoing when you don't know that they're engaged in wrongdoing. It means asking, can I, can, is, are there ways to figure out what's going on um, in more safe ways? I certainly could have um, contacted lawyers and people who I knew in Washington who knew more about the legal system than I did, who could have, I think, provided me with far greater wisdom. But I was busy, so I stayed in my own lane, and I didn't pursue um, that information as much as I think I should have. So Max, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to come back now and talk specifically more concrete for the audience about what can we do as we confront our own complicity um, and just breaking it down on an individual level, what would be some of the one or two or three steps you will tell an executive who may have to confront his own complicity, his or her own complicity uh, in a different, in, under different circumstances? What are the three things 
they should be aware of as we think of complicity and the negative impact complicity that has on society. What 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 are the yeah. key things to be aware of? Sure. So first of all, I, I'm, first observation is when we deliberate, we tend to be more ethical than when we act on our uh, momentary intuition. So I think right now, like today, is a good time for people listening to think about to what degree have they been complicit in wrongdoing in the past? Because in the book, as you note, I identify many episodes where I've been complicit in the past. And think about how do I want to deal with these kinds of episodes in the future? I think the more you've thought about how you want to act, the more ethical you're likely to be. Um, uh, Second uh, piece of advice following a comment that you made earlier, Lawrence, think about the social environment. Mm -hmm. Um, If you think something's going on, who else is likely to think that something is going on? So create a social atmosphere where it's more comfortable to act. And finally, since we have leaders who are listening to this um, uh, to this series, um, think about the environment that you're creating and how would you create an environment that would lead your employees to speak out when that would be the appropriate ethical action. So I think that those are kind of three steps that we can all take that would lead us to be less complicit in the future than we might have been in the past. So before we become employees, before we become students of Max Bezerman, we are we're children. We live with our parents, and we have a lot of parents, I'm sure, listening to this conversation as well. How do we start teaching our kids about the importance of not being complicit? Because a lot of the egregious things that have happened to young people uh, happen because they remain silent when these things happen, right? For some reason, the IRC something say nothing. So how do we start teaching how not to be complicit, even at the very primary, secondary, high school level. Yeah. So, so first of all, I'm not a developmental psychologist, so I, so I, I don't think you should get your child rearing advice um, <laughs> from me. But, but, but I, 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 I will make a couple of comments, and that is, I think that we should think about sort of when we encourage young people to defer to authority. I think we should think about why do we want them to defer to authority. And rather than rather than teaching a simple role, listen to your teacher. There are good reasons why you should listen to your teacher. And I think that you want to um, sort of identify those reasons so that people are acting to develop themselves personally, to be good citizens of the community, to be sort of people that other people in the organization value, rather than simply following a simple role. Um, listen to your teacher. So simple roles end up being problematic. I think we want to create more deliberation, more thoughtful individuals about uh, uh, create people who want to um, sort of enhance their skills, enhance their ethicality, and enhance their value to the community rather than simply being simple role followers. I think mm-hmm. simple roles are all, um, um, are almost always problematic, and we want to think more deliberatively about how to create better human beings. Yeah. So, so some of the folks on this call are also sitting on boards of organizations, and I know one of the big topics that have been growing across across the world, across the corporate world for the last uh, five, six, seven years, has been the issue around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, talk about culture, because in the book you talk about leaders creating the culture that would allow complicity uh, to not uh, be part of the culture. How do we think about that as we design programs around diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so so first of all, I think um, you, you, start, you started with the board. Um, I think too many boards are chosen by the CEO in order to ratify what the CEO wants. And I think boards need to understand their oversight responsibilities. Um, I think that organizations should be very deliberative about thinking about the nature of the organization, how it got to be the way it is, um, and whether or not there are institutionalized forces that work against diversity and inclusion. So, um, you know, we used to have old-fashioned sexism and racism that was pretty explicit. Now we tend to have more implicit sexism and racism um, in our organizations, and we need to think about 
why that's the case, what it is that we value. Um, have we sort of engaged in affirmative action so that there are leaders at the top who look like the representation of the employees and the society more generally? Um, I think that there's lots of um, lots of um, things we can learn from looking at these problems from a distance. Um, look at the data. Sort of many organizations have a habit of they're pretty good at making sure that there's um, women and um, and people with diversity um, in their final selection group. But so often it's the white guy who still ends up getting the job in the end. Um, I think a lot of organizations, a lot of venture capital firms could learn a whole lot by systematically looking at their past behavior and see how they make decisions and what is it that they, that they value um, in the process. So obviously there's a there's a massive literature, there's lots of expertise on how to create a more diverse and inclusive environment. Um, I, I would simply say that, um, that, that we need to be deliberative and thoughtful um, so that we can identify the right opportunities for um, our own organizations. So I, I, I go and open the book for the first time and I'm going to wrap up by going to the last page in the epilogue where you talk about basically wanting to make this world a better place. You, says, you say that basically sometimes this puts our relationship at risk when we try to be uh, complicit and sometimes we'll be uncomfortable. But it's the ethical thing to do. So as we think of the world today with all the challenges we're facing, you know, dealing with climate change, we're dealing with some geopolitical issues, we're dealing with economic issues, hardships, we have fairness issues. How do we frame all of these issues from an ethical standpoint? There's a big question for the last three minutes, but maybe sure. start. How do we frame all of these issues we're dealing with in the context of ethics so that we can see how not being complicit when we see unethical behavior in terms of how we use natural resources, how we design public policy, how do we frame these big issues from an ethical standpoint? Terrific question. And, and you know, uh, we all we all use natural resources. We all um, need natural resources. Um, but I think that we, can, we I think we have an obligation, particularly people working in the natural resource world, um, to think about how to create value more broadly and, and value more broadly, not only includes people who are alive today, but people who will be alive in the future after we're gone. And to the extent that we overvalue people um, who happen to be alive in 2023 and are ignoring people who will be alive in 2100, um, we're, we're, we're taking from them. And, and that has important ethical obligations. To the extent that we see organizations who are misleading the public intentionally about the climate change debate, and we go along with that, um, then we end up being complicit. So I think that um, we have a moral obligation um, to not only think about our own need for natural sources, which we obviously have, but the needs for all of us. And all of us means all of us across the world, but also future citizens of the world. And, and to wrap things up, Max, you know, we've seen the consequences of inaction when it comes to complicity. And what would you then, to wrap up, what would you say to help the listener uh, to use uh, what I would call a complicity lens in their engagement so that as, I, as I've as i done when I read the book, I kept asking myself, well, have I been complicit on certain issues where I've not spoken up or where I've sort of not really given it the thought? So how, how do we purposefully think about not being complicit in our day-to-day -day living, whether it's when we're, how yeah. we react to the climate, how we react to what we do in the news, how do we uh, practically, to end this conversation, how do we practically go about our day-to-day -day not being complicit about wrongdoing? So, so two things. One, um, I, I alluded to before, now's a good time to stop and think about your own complicity in the past and how you want to behave in the future. So if you wait till, you, till the moment happens when I'm asked to change my testimony, mm. okay, and I'm busy, I don't think about it. I, I think I, I, I now have a clear sense of what I would do in that episode. So I think we want to deliberate when we're not in the heat of the moment about who's the person we want to um, be. And I think we can we can all think ahead to the time when we're 75 
and we're retired and we're looking back at our career and think about who's the person that you will wish that you had been and why not start acting like that person now rather than have regret later on that you didn't meet the ethical standards that you actually have for yourself. That's a very good way to wrap up this conversation, proactively thinking about your own complicity, not towards the system you live in today, but those who are coming after you. Think about the next generation, how you cannot be complicit about things that will affect them. Uh, Max, this has been great. Again, congratulations on the book. I've seen uh, lots of good reviews and I really enjoy reading it. Uh, thank you, Dean, for spending some time with us here. Uh, and it's been great. Uh, and um, yeah, hope to see you soon when you're back in Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Lawrence. It's been a delight to talk with you. Thank you.